hold an event every Thursday at noon on a, any social issue that our community wants to talk about. And we are really lucky today we have a student presentation. And as students, I hope that will inspire you to want to do one yourself. So that would be awesome. Um, why the library? Well, we see this as an extension of the library's work with freedom of information and expression of ideas. And we want to have lots of different opinions. Just like there are many books out on the shelf that somebody will not agree with. In fact, every book in the library, there's somebody who won't agree with. We know that we have issues that we don't agree with, but we want a space where we can talk about them and have a discussion with respect. And um, I welcome you all to this event today. If you'd like to learn more about this topic, we have a lot of books in the library on it. This, there's just a collection right over here at the front of the classroom that you can look at later. Next week, Kelsey Mackey, communication faculty, will discuss fighting food deserts. Why do some neighborhoods lack access to fresh food? Why do some neighborhoods only have drive-in restaurants? Okay, that's what she's going to talk about, important social justice issue. And this week, uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome Jamal Trey Jackson. <laughs>
lives literally depend on us facing the realities behind race and what it is connected to because you can't simply talk about race and this is something that I'm always reminded of when I talk about this issue you can't talk about race without talking about gender and class and sexuality physical ability mental capabilities as well there's all kinds of things that that that, that intersect with this particular topic uh, before I continue I would just like to say I would just like to say a, a thank you to my parents who are not here, but will hopefully be seeing this YouTube video uh, later. Uh, I want to say thank you to my mother, Gloria, and her mother, Christine, my grandmother, uh, my father, James, uh, his mother, Johnny, and uh, uh, his, his, his father. Uh, not his biological father, but who he calls father, and who I call grandfather. Uh, 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 Larry. Grandpa Larry. Grandpa Larry. Because <laughs> I call him Grandpa, right? <laughs> also, I would like to thank, I would also like to thank my stepmother, Tabitha, and her parents, uh, Veronica and Melvin. Uh, they have been such an immense inspiration to me, and without me asking some of the questions and them guiding me along on this journey that I am taking, which, which is terrifying, but so empowering at the same time. Um, uh, I, I thank them for their support and their love. Uh, I want to start off, I want to start off uh, as well by saying that I'm not coming to you as an authority. I'm not coming to you saying that I know everything about this particular subject matter. Uh, if anything, uh, a lot of why I'm talking about this in the first place is because I am still struggling with aspects of my own ignorance. Uh, what led me to this point was 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 essentially a devastating experience dealing with what I am certain is institutional racism that I didn't even have the literacy to confront. I didn't even know what was happening to me at the time. All that I know, and, and I wasn't even aware of it then, but I was blamed for what had happened to me. And, and on top of that, I agreed with them, and I believed them, and I carried that with me for a long, long time, and it was hard, to say the least, uh, and, and that is part of why I'm here. So again, I'm not speaking to you as an authority. I'm hoping to start a dialogue and a conversation and hopefully get people to start moving and hopefully talking to each other, and hopefully something will happen. What I'd like to, what I'd like to do is, as well uh, to hopefully let some of these thoughts kind of sink in for a bit is I'd like to play this clip from uh, a video uh, that you can find on YouTube titled uh, Baldwin's Nigger, and it has to deal with James Baldwin giving a talk on, on different elements involving race and power and oppression. Um, the clip, in case those of you uh, who can't hear it, maybe, the, the audio all too great, we haven't had it, actually had a chance to test it just yet, but um, uh, the, the clip that I will be playing is from the three minute 25 second mark to roughly the seven and a half minute mark. Uh, and also that's kind of telling my parents if they want to see this. will be 
be on there with the video yeah, and okay. with a list of the books that uh, we okay. recommend for further study. Ah, such, <laughs> such a powerful video. Anyways, James Baldwin, James Baldwin. <laughs> James Baldwin is a, is, is a huge individual. So where, 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 where to start? So, beautiful black people, allies, I am here today, hopefully, to ask, and hopefully, I don't know, I don't know necessarily if I'm trying to convince you, but, but I'm going to, I'm going to ask that we make a move. Black people, we need to make a move, and allies, and hopefully potential allies, I hope that you will move with us in solidarity with us. Um, the, the definition of solidarity is something that I've been kind of mulling over in my mind trying to figure out what exactly it means. And in conversations that I've been having with people, there's this, there's this I've been accused of being a separatist. I've been accused of, I, I've been accused of, uh, of having hate in my heart when, when approaching this subject matter. Uh, people have, people have, somehow stated to me that if it wasn't because of me talking about race, no one would talk about race, which is true on one hand, but the logic is, is somewhat faulty. Uh, so, so what I'm here today is, <laughs> I want to say we have to make a move. Black people, we have to make a move. The state, the state of our nation at this particular moment is such that we have a black president and a first lady who are telling black people to stop making excuses, right? That's the nature of our society. We, 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 have, we have a black president telling black people in this country to stop making excuses. And there are a lot of people who may agree with that statement. But I have a feeling that if you investigate a little further, you would not know. You, they, they probably don't know enough about the history of this country. And so, one of the things I'd like to do is I'd like to share some stories that really, uh, just, just a couple of anecdotes, I'll make them as quick as possible, uh, that, that really led me to this point. Uh, the first story is that uh, over the summer, over the summer, I, I embarked upon this interview project. Um, I took a tape recorder around town uh, to different neighborhoods of Seattle, and I, I was interviewing white people about race and racism. And when I, the, the reason I got this idea is because, uh, to, to, to begin with, I, I took Sociology 150 in the uh, fall of 2011, I believe. And, uh, and, and, and this, was, this was the first time in my life, at the age of 27 years old, the first reading that we had said that race is a social construct that it is not real. And so, before I launch into the story, before I launch into the story, I wanna ask, I wanna, I wanna ask you all, what makes me black? What makes me black? Well, but I don't think that's black, right? So, what makes me black? Right? Melanin is a thing, and it has this particular response, and it, it, it creates this particular thing, but I don't, think, I don't think black was a term that existed before humans arrived on this planet, right? So what makes me black? I do. <clears throat> Brilliant, right? I agree. Essentially, it's this idea of whiteness that makes me black. And this is something that we don't seem to typically have a lot of conversations on, or at least I seem to be out of the loop. Because believe me, I want to I want to talk about whiteness. I want to know. I want to understand whiteness. I want to understand white people. And 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 the odd thing about that is that I think I think considering where I came from, you know, I I live here. I was born in America. I live here. I was born here. That I have a feeling that I know more about white people than white people know about me. And why is that, right? Whose survival depends on whom, right? My survival depends on knowing how white people are, how they think and what they do, and how they will punish me if I step out of line, right? 
So that's 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 a portion of my survival, right? But but I am certain that white people's survival does not depend on similar on similar dynamics. And so so one of the stories that I was having, so I I I embarked upon this interview process. I was going around Seattle, I was interviewing white people about <laughs> race and racism. Very generic questions, just very basic questions. And when I say generic, I mean in the sense that that you didn't have to put racism. You, 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 could put, you could put any ism or anything into that particular place and ask these same questions and it would still be relevant. It would still work in the same format. Uh, just very simple questions because obviously you're, you're approaching people on the street and you can't get engaged. You're like, let's talk about racism, right? Like shake, shake people like, we gotta talk about racism. This country's crumbling, you know? So, so I, was sitting, I was sitting in a coffee shop with a friend of mine. I, I'd been on the interview. Uh, I had initially started off trying to do 100 interviews. And then I very quickly learned that 100 was well out of my capability and I didn't have the strength and energy for it, so I broke it down to 50. And then very shortly after that, I realized that I didn't have the strength for that and I broke it down to 30. And by the time I was at about 25 of them, I almost felt that I could not go on. It was taking so much energy out of me and it hurt so much because I had to keep a straight face and listen to the responses of these people. And the main reason, the main reason I embarked on this process in the first place is because I started before I had the idea of an interview in my mind, is that I just started asking my white friends, right? So I'm learning all these things about race. I'm reading all these things about race. I'm hearing about, all my life, I have been around white people, all my life. They've been my best friends. They've been my intimate partners. They've been my teachers. They've been my neighbors. They've been the, the businessmen in areas. I've been, I've been around white people all my life. They are all I have ever known. And all my life, these people told me that if I worked hard, if I was honest, if I treated others as I wanted to be treated, if I believed in what I did, that I would succeed all my life, right? And so here I am learning about race and the realities behind race in this country. And my first instinct is, but they told me this. They told me this other thing. And so I just started asking my friends. It was just a casual thing. And what I started to notice is that people were answering certain questions in almost the same way, almost verbatim, word for word. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, they probably didn't do their homework. They probably haven't studied this. They probably didn't have to know. So why would, why would these very different people from different areas in my life and outside of my life and acquaintances and all that, why would they respond, why would they respond the same way to the same types of questions. So I got a tape recorder and I put together this series of questions and I and I hit the streets. You know? And so and so I'm sitting in a coffee shop and I'm talking I'm talking to my friend. She's a white she is a white woman and, and we have had some really intense conversations on this and 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 I was just so I was so exhausted. I had about five more interviews to go and I didn't I just couldn't I just couldn't bring myself to do it. it taking so much energy out of me, it was so hard, so difficult. And, and I was just telling her about it, and somehow this thought came into my mind, maybe it was the exhaustion. This, this thought came into my mind, just this relatively simplistic question, uh, probably so simplistic that it's problematic, is that I simply asked her, I said, I, I asked her, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll propose this to you, think about it, is that if history has any relevance to what is happening now. If history has any relevance to what is happening right now, who is responsible for the state of black people today? This is what I asked her. I said, who is responsible for the state of black people today? And her response, which I expected, was, well, it's complicated. Well, it's a lot of things. I, I don't know. And she, she, she. <coughs> She, she listed a couple of things that she thought was going on. You mentioned war and oppression and you know, power dynamics and all that, and, 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 so I, and I let her speak. And so when she finally, when she finally finished this up, I, I asked her, I said, what do you think I would say? And, she's, and she says, I don't know. And I, and, and, and I had to say, really? <laughs> I was like, if someone came up to me and asked me, said, Jamal Trey Jackson, black and proud, uh, <laughs> Jamal Trey Jackson, if, if history has any relevance to what's happening right now, if history means anything 
to the ground we are standing on right now, who's responsible for the state of black people today? And I asked her, and I asked her, I said, I said, you don't know what I'd say? She's like, I don't know. And so I just said, white people. <laughs> I said, white people. And then I had to ask her, I, I let it sit in the air for a bit. And I had to ask her, and I will ask you, why would I say such a thing? True. Am I trying to be mean? Is it not true? true? Is it not a conversation that we need to have? Yes. Because I can't talk about being black in America without talking about white people in America and talking about other groups of people. And, I, and, and it kills me that the word other even comes out of my mouth when I say that, right? Because other is such a damaging word and such a damaging tactic and ideology. And then, and then she said something else to me. And we, we, we kind of went back and forth and she, she essentially expressed to me that what she felt, what she felt that black people want in this country, what she feels that black people want in this country is pity. Wow. Is what she said to me. And, and the funny thing is, the funny thing she said, and it didn't even, it didn't even register to me. I mean, I was just, I was just kind of sitting there and she said the word and I just sat there staring off into space for a second. And then it kind of dawned on me what that kind of means. It, it dawned on me what, what that could imply. And then, and then the severity of it started to kind of ramp up in my mind. And, and I almost became frantic and I said, and I said, what makes you think black people want pity? And she said, well, I don't know, I think everybody wants pity. You know, sometimes you're going through a hard time. <laughs> you, know, you, want, you want pity. And, and, and I don't mean to cause the chuckle because she, she is so important. And the reason I'm standing here right now is in large part because of her. And, uh, and, and, and she, she has been such an inspiration to me. And I'm not, I'm not poking fun at her. But what I told her is that I just simply said to her, I said, I said, black people do not want pity. Black people do not want pity. What black people want and have been asking for, shouting for, demanding this whole time is for white people to get out of our way, right? For white people to get out of our way. We can do anything we want to do. We are capable of taking care of ourselves. Stokely Carmichael in Black Power, a book that was published in 1967, stated that even then, the idea that black people can do things for themselves is a radical notion, and it is still a radical notion to this day. And another story, I guess, another story. I was having a conversation with a young black man. I was having a conversation with a young black man. He essentially expressed to me that what he felt, he expressed to me that he felt that black people are responsible for their own suffering. And that black people are responsible for their own oppression. And then on top of that, he stated, matter of factly, that black people do not want to learn. And he stated, matter of factly to me, that black people do not want to learn. And so I challenged him on these ideas, and we went back and forth for a little while. And, and at some point he got frustrated, and he kind of threw his hands up in the air, and he says, oh, so I bet you're going to start blaming white people, right? He said, so probably you're gonna tell me that like white people have everything to do with this, right? You're gonna blame this solely on, on white people. And I told him, I said, I'm not going to place the blame solely on white people, but I'm not going to deny that they are involved. I am not going to deny that they have a part in this. And what killed me the most about that is that chances are, had it been, had you caught me maybe a year or so ago, two years maybe more, that if you had if you had caught me in the right situation, those words probably would have came out of my mouth, right? Or a similar ideology would have, would have came out of my mouth. I probably would have said the same thing. So essentially what I'm dealing with, what I'm dealing with right now is that I'm starting to realize, I'm starting to, I'm trying, I'm starting to understand these ideas of internalized oppression. 
because that's what I went through. That's what I went through when I was when I was recovering from from so and a, a devastating emotional crisis due to again what I feel was uh, most certainly institutional racism. Is that is that I I found I found that I could not I could not tell myself that I loved myself. I, I I found myself reliving the situation that had happened to me at this, you know, I don't know I don't know if this would count as slander, but I used to work at the Elliott Bay Book Company right around the corner, and I and 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 I used to I used to, I used to relive those situations in my head, and I believed them. I believed them for what they told me, and when I confronted them about it, you know, I pushed back. I pushed back before I quit. I pushed back, and I and 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 it got to a point where I quit. And then about a month later, I came back, spoke with the owner of the store, and I asked him. I I I, I told him that I reviewed every scenario. <coughs> I reviewed every scenario in my mind of what it could have been, and race was the last thing on my mind. And race wasn't something that I was even going to talk about. I wasn't even going to mention it. But I went through every avenue. Like, did I not do this enough? Did I not do this enough? I'm like, no, I did do this. I was like, no, I did do this. No, they told me that this is what I was supposed to do, and I did that. And so I went to them and I said, what could it have been? Why are you treating these people this way and me this way? And so, and so, so essentially, and so essentially, I, I couldn't think of anything else. He, he deflected all my arguments. And, 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 and so, so then the thought came to my mind, maybe it's this one thing, I've got nothing else. So I said, so I said, do you think race may have been involved? And here I am, right? I'm standing in front of a white man Asking him, do you think maybe race was involved? He said, oh no. <laughs> you know, and, and, and ultimately what ended up happening, what ended up happening is that he ultimately told me to forgive myself. And, 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 and again, I believed him, you know? And, and what I didn't understand at that particular moment, what I didn't understand at that particular moment was that the reason I went to him in the first place is because I felt that I could trust him. I felt that I could trust him. And so he left me with this particular idea in my head that overrided my own voice, mm -hmm. that overrided the things in the back of my mind that I already knew, you know, that, that, that I knew about myself, the certainty of, about what my work ethic is and what I deem as important, uh, my own integrity, undermined my own integrity, made me question myself. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you for months, for months, I, I felt I felt as if I was at, at the bottom of an ocean, and, and that I was tearing myself apart inside, reliving these things, thinking that I was the one who was a problem, and that I was a part of it. Um, but you know, one of the things that really kind of jolted me out of this was again being in sociology 150 with Professor Oka. The first reading that we did talked about race as a social construct that it is merely a tool to divide people. An arbitrary tool just to basically just to basically divide and conquer us, right? And and this isn't a thing, this isn't a thing that works against black people. This is a thing that works against white people. And that's that's the hard thing. That's the hard thing to kind of get across. That's the point to get across, right? Because our standards of beauty, our standards of this and that and whatnot are on this white standard, right? And so to tell white people that this is making them hurt at the same time, is you you gotta bring you gotta bring a damn fine argument. And I don't think I have that argument, unfortunately. I want that, I want to be able to have that argument, but at the meantime, I, all I know is this is what I understand. All my life, never being connected with a black community, never being connected to any black community, all my life is that I'm hitting this point where I'm starting to realize that I have been on this trajectory away from a black community, thinking that I was exceptional, that I was special, that I am not like these people, right? The same kind of ideology, right? Like, I'm not like those people, right? Like, here I am, I'm black, I'm not, I'm not like those people. You know? And so, and so what I'm realizing now is that all my life, kind of being buffeted along with these couple of experiences here and there where I could easily shrug them off, and I said, hey, you know, they're just jerks. Hey, you know, I can't believe people are doing that in 2013, man. We're so advanced, so progressive, right? And so, and so, and so, what ultimately happened is that I, I feel that I ran into a group of people uh, that were the wrong group of people, I suppose, right? It was just that all my life is just these, these kind of love taps, these kind of racist love taps, right? 
and 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 all of a sudden I hit this I hit this bombshell right it was just all these things all these these multiple things that that somehow fate led me to this path where just several things were colliding at once and I happened to be in 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 that that drop zone I don't know I don't know what the term is for a huge explosion or something like that but um so essentially what this recovery process has done for me, and specifically this interview process, because my first instinct when I started learning the realities of races, I go to the people that I know best, right? I go to the people closest to me, right? And so that's what I did. I said, I, I'll ask my friends, I'll ask my family, why didn't you teach me these things? Why didn't you tell me these things? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and especially with white people, I essentially went to white people and I said, when were you going to tell me? <laughs> I said, I said, I said, white people, when were you going to tell me? Right? You know, you're, you're saying that you're saying that you know, you know. Uh, truth and integrity and honesty and something like this is what white people are telling you. They're telling me truth, honesty, integrity, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't exploit people. You don't oppress people. Mm -hmm. You know, Martin Luther King, right? You know, like they, 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 they they'll be the first ones to say, oh, like Martin Luther King, uh, uh, content of character, blah 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 blah. Can't tell me anything else, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and so, so, so I found myself asking white people. When were you going to tell me? When when were you going when were you going to let me know? And they won't. And they will <coughs> not. You know? And 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 this is a big generality to make. And it's and it's and and it's potentially problematic. But I think there's there, there is a huge grain of truth in this. In that essentially this is one of the aspects of power, or at least perceived power, right? Mm. Because again, <laughs> one of the things one of the things that just seems so interesting to me is that we can't seem to figure out, we can't seem to figure out that essentially all that's happening is that there's a pyramid. And at the top of this pyramid, there's a small group of human beings that fit a particular uh, racial uh, uh, gender dynamic that they're at the top of the pyramid and, and they're deciding there's a uh, small amount of human beings at the top of the pyramid deciding which other human beings at the bottom of the pyramid deserve human rights. Right? That's, that's, that's ultimately what's happening. So while we're down here squabbling about uh, racism, uh, homophobia, sexism, and all these things, right? You know, the issues, right? Is there any reason whatsoever to deny a human being access to food, water, and shelter? Is there any justifiable reason to, to deny another human being from access to food, water, and shelter? I, because he's black? Because she's gay? They can't have food, water, and shelter? Is that the reason? Because they're poor? Food, water, and shelter because they're poor? And, and believe me, talking about uh, homelessness in Seattle, right? Right? I mean, we are we are cutting budget after budget after budget. And how, how can you say that budget cuts are making things better? How can anyone give that argument that budget cuts are making anything better? But that's 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 a bit of that's a bit of a tangle. <laughs> you know, so so essentially. One of the things that I'm dealing with right now is that I'm scrambling, right? Being being on this trajectory away from the black community all my life, thinking to myself, like, yeah, I'm just gonna go to school and go to college and get a job, right? And 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 never 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 understanding that that wherever I go in my life, that it wasn't for the black community. There was no intention of making any overt effort to give back to the community, to go back to the community, to even seek out that community. And what I'm realizing now is that is that no matter how far away that I get, no matter how special, no matter how rich and wealthy and, 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 and whatever I get, no matter what happens is that if my people from my community, in this case being black, right? If people in the black community aren't safe, no matter where I go, I am not safe. And there's plenty of evidence to indicate this, and one one particular aspect that I'd like to bring up that I think that I think is is, is one of those things on everybody's mind. We're gonna be we're all gonna be in nursing homes later, ideally, hopefully not, uh, in our lives, and we're gonna be like we're, we're gonna be thinking back to this event. So I, I'd like to propose a scenario to everyone. Imagine, imagine that you are a police officer, and you show up to you show up to a scene. And you're faced with this topic. This is the state of our nation, by the way. This this is this is something that we can't seem to figure out. We're like, we don't we don't know what to do in this situation. So you are a police officer, you ride you arrive to a scene, and you see a grown man with a smoking gun and a dead 
armless child, uh, a defenseless child. <laughs> A dead, a, defend, a dead, defenseless child, right? Unarmed. 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 That's the word. <laughs> right? But that's, that's, that's the state of our country right now, right? That we don't know what to do in this situation. I just heard a report on Democracy Now! this morning that said that the, the attorneys uh, that are defending George Zimmerman have proposed, had made a request that was refused, luckily, to, to, to find, to use evidence of uh, Trayvon Martin's marijuana usage and his text messages in defending George Zimmerman, right? The victim, right? George Zimmerman, we need to protect George Zimmerman, right? I mean, like, that is the state of our country, that we can arrive to a scene like that and we don't know what to do, right? So we arrive to the scene, grown man, smoking gun, dead, defenseless child. Cop shows up to the scene. The guy with the gun says, standing my ground. Cop says, okay. You mind cleaning up this mess? Probably not. That's just that's that's me from Jackson. Um, but but that's essentially the nature of it, you know? I, I would think that it would be a logical thing. Be like, hey, stand your ground. It is the law, and, and it is your right to say so. But let me take you down to the station and let's fill out a report. Right? They didn't even do that. And that's the nature of our country, right? And so, and, but believe me, Trayvon Martin is not, <laughs> he's not the only one. Yeah. Uh, there, is, there, is a, there is an organization called the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement. And they, they embarked on a project that originally started off being, uh, being titled uh, every, every 30 Hours. But at the end of at the end of 2012, it ended up that they changed the name of the project to Every 28 Hours. And essentially what it says is that every 28 hours, a black man or woman is killed by what they term as extrajudicial uh, police violence, uh, police action. Uh, and so uh, the report talks about 313 instances of extrajudicial killings by the police in 2012 of black men, women, and children. Right? And so, oh, oh, oh okay. So, so, so essentially, because I really want to open this up for discussion, because we need to talk about this. <coughs> so again, the state of this country is that here we are, we have a black president telling black people in the United States of America to stop making excuses, right? Just, you know, probably to tell me to stop making excuses about what happened to me. Another thing that's happening is that another individual who's in the news, which is, which is so brilliant to me because it is just so completely backwards in my opinion, is that our government, our FBI, has recently placed a black woman at the number one spot on the FBI's most wanted list, and they are calling her a terrorist. And this woman is Asada Shakur, right? This, is, this woman is Asada Shakur, who's now living in, uh, in exile in Cuba, uh, convicted of a crime, uh, uh, convicted of the crime of murdering a police officer, despite what the evidence says. And so now she's living in exile. She escaped from prison with the, with the help of some of her comrades, in order, uh, in order, because she she felt that her life was in danger as long as she be she be locked up. But essentially, our government, right, is basically calling this single black woman, who is who is calling for black liberation, black self determination, and self determination of all oppressed peoples, right? And our government is calling her a terrorist. And as far I, I tell you, when I heard that story, and it was again, it was on Democracy Now. Um, when I heard that story, the first thought that came into my mind is that that is, that is A, on the face of this, this, this administration and this nation. That's, that's, that's A on the face. That's, that's, that's too obvious. That's too easy, right? To talk for, it's an intimidation tactic, right? It's basically saying if you're going to talk about, if you're going to talk about these things, this, this is what's waiting for you, mm -hmm. right? And so, and so, Asadi Shakur, I mean, just absolutely amazing. There, oh, by the way, there's this, there's this really amazing book that I'm totally, it's totally overdue from the library. It's called, Want to Start a Revolution? <laughs> radical Black, uh, Radical Women in the Black Freedom Struggle. 
there is there is an essay in here that's talking about Asada Shakur that that uh, just absolutely powerful. There is there is an essay about Yuri Kochiyama, Japanese American woman who stood in solidarity with with uh, the, the Black Freedom Struggle, Black Civil Rights, uh, Black Power Movement, uh, and also it talks about Rosa Parks, right? Because again, touching on my own ignorance, touching on my own ignorance about this the, these particular topics is that is that even even to this day. If you, if you say Martin Luther King, I'll say I have a dream. If you say Rosa Parks, I say she didn't want to give up her seat. If you say Harriet Tubman, I will say <laughs> Underground Railroad, right? And yet, and yet, I can't seem to tell you anything else, right? And so, so another question I would ask you is what have you learned about black people today, outside of what I've told? Uh, uh, before you came into here, what did you learn about black people today? What did you learn about black people yesterday? The day before, the week before, the month before. What did you learn about black people in Black History Month? Right? <laughs> you know, and, and so this is the thing, specifically with black people, is that we are not, we are not learning about who we are, right? Uh, and, and I'm convinced, and, and I'm convinced that that if we are not learning about black people, we are not learning about who we are. And this goes for everybody. You know, and I'm not saying that we have to specifically learn about black people. I would hope that you would like to learn about tons of, 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 of different groups of people, diverse women and men all over the world who are doing some great and powerful things, fighting against oppression, fighting against poverty, right? Fighting against any given ism. You know, is that, is that I can't help but wonder how history is gonna remember our generation how is history going to remember our generation? Because I, I have to confess to you, I didn't do the work, right? I didn't do the work. I was born into this room, and there was all these, there were these pictures: Martin Luther King, Harry Tubman, on the wall, right? And it doesn't, you know, and it didn't mean anything to me. They, they, they told me these stories. They said, Martin Luther King, I have a dream. Rosa Parks did this thing on the bus. Harry Tubman, Underground Railroad, right? And it didn't mean anything to me. I didn't, uh, I didn't pick up, I, I didn't, the, the baton wasn't handed to me. I didn't continue the struggle. I didn't do any of the work. So when we talk about progress, how did we get here? I didn't do the work, you know? And, and, and that's one of the things that I'm reeling from right now. The reason I'm doing this, that, that interview project, the reason, the reason I'm starting to do these readings, the reason I'm here in front of you right now is because I'm realizing that I didn't do the work. We have been riding this wave of the civil rights movement that, that crashed on the shore a long time ago. And we, we and here we are flopping around like fish thinking we're still in the water. And so we need to make a move. And there, there are a lot of things happening right now. God, and I'm so sorry to hold you guys so long. I really want the discussion here. And I hope some of you can stick around because I'm gonna stick around and let's talk. But there are so many things happening right here. So many things happening in this school just recently, right? <laughs> just recently, there was just this, there was this instance that, that essentially, the, the, the best way to say it is, right, the voices, the voices of 700 students were largely ignored by the institutions that are supposed to be representing the students, right? The voices of 700 students, and this is not a slight against that, the, the individuals in that institution. <coughs> this is just, this is calling to the individuals within that institution to like, let's take a look at it. This is not a slight to individuals. This is not an attack on individuals. I'm talking about the structure, right? Because here it is, the voices of 700 students basically saying, we want to maintain our cultural connection. We want to maintain our obligation that we agreed to 40 years ago. And what I'm talking about is the George Sudakawa Fountain down in the atrium that has fallen into disrepair and that faculty and staff, 700 plus students, community members, all supported and donated to and worked very, very hard for this project. People in student leadership have been, have been fighting for this thing. And, and here we are fighting to hold on to this bit of our heritage and our culture. And, we, and our voices were largely ignored by the people who are supposed to be representing our voices. And this is happening every day, our president, our president, in my opinion, is essentially attempting to deliver black men into the hands of the police. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying, I'm not saying in the sense of having us locked up, but having us lock up ourselves, right? 
You know, and, and the conversation about the function of the police is, is something, it's an entirely different subject. But essentially, I mean, what does that say, right? I was like, why would I want to work for the police? Why would I want to work for the police, right? I mean, but but again, that's that's that, that is that is a that is something else altogether. You know, so so this is this is the nature of what we're dealing with. That even our institution right now, this institution that gave me the literacy to understand what was happening to me, that gave me the literacy to, to appreciate artwork for what it what it can tell us about history and what it can tell us about what's happening now. You know, that this place gave me the literacy to be able to take a look at these crumbling structures and realize that they're crumbling, right? I mean, for instance, we live in a world where essentially if these walls were radioactive and we put some different wallpaper up on it, if we got sick, they would blame us, right? These people who actually had the means to protect themselves from these, these radicals floating through the air, right? They would blame us for getting sick. And that's the country that we live in. You know, and this is not even talking about what we did, what we do to other countries, calling all the other people terrorists as if we didn't do anything to anyone for any reason whatsoever, right? We didn't do anything to anyone, right? People attack us because we didn't do anything to anyone, right? You know, we just keep getting bigger and bigger guns and, and, and we think we're safer? We're getting bigger and bigger guns and we think we're safer, right? So what are we gonna do? We need to move, and I swear, if you all leave this room right now and you don't start talking to each other, I don't care what, what ethnic group you're from, I don't care what, what your, your demographic is, whatever it is, if you don't start talking to each other like human beings, and I'm not saying in the sense of like, like uh, transcendence of race or anything like that, I'm not saying color blindness, I'm saying you, <laughs> our differences are what makes us strong, and they must be acknowledged, and to deny that is to deny yourself. To deny that in anyone else is to deny yourself. And I swear, if you leave this room and you're not talking to each other and trying to figure out how to make this shit work, pardon my Portuguese. <laughs> because I am operating, I am operating, I am operating on this ideology, this idea that no one gives a fuck about black people. I, I am operating on this assumption that no one gives a fuck about black people. And I swear that I truly believe to a significant extent that even black people don't seem to care about black people. And this is something, and I'm telling you, and I'm guilty of that as well. And I'm trying to turn, I'm trying to turn, I'm trying to turn this ship around and go back to the black community and start building up my people because my people are beautiful and they are strong and they are powerful and they are why I'm standing here today. And thank you so much. I, I just <laughs> that you asked, uh, you asked your friend about uh, what, who is responsible for the state of black people. That is the question that I ask myself all the time. Who is, and I struggle with, with, with the personal responsibility and, and history, white history. And um, I feel, I feel like you do need a movement. I feel like something does need to change. You're right, I don't, I don't see where our generation is gonna have any place in history. It's all gonna be, you know, the civil rights movement and slavery, it's all we're ever gonna hear about. Um, I, my problem, and because I do plan to be a teacher and I'm trying to be an advocate for, you know, young black people that are struggling, I, I like personal responsibility. I feel like we hear, we talk about Rosa Parks and Harriet Tubman and Martin Luther King and we don't really understand what that means when when I hear Rosa Parks' story, you you know oh she you know she gave up her you know, she didn't want to give up her speech she went to jail you know all of this great stuff happened, but not really thinking that she one day decided that she wasn't getting up and she knew that if she if she got up from that seat, it would always be that way. Mm -hmm. Harriet Tubman, 
was free. She was gone. She could have kept going. I, and I think about what she was thinking about when she decided to come back and help others. So when I when I think about, when I read about the Civil Rights Movement and all, all my history and all my ancestors and the slaves, not oh my goodness, all that they went through and their beatings and the, and the ships and all of that. And then, and I'm sitting in class. There's no error, or I don't want to do my homework, or I don't want to, you know, I don't want to listen to my teacher. I feel guilty Word. because they did they they did all of that for me. So when we when we, we do need, I feel like that needs to be taught. She didn't just sit down. She didn't just sit down and refuse. She was thinking about me. She was thinking about the future. <laughs> and um, my, I feel like black people don't do enough of that. We can't even, yes, we want white people out of our way, but they kind they kind of they kind of they kind of shifted a little bit or they're just a little bit more and we're in our we're in our own way. That's not about pity, but it's it's self hate, which has we inherited. But self hate leads to self destruction discussion. Sorry, I can't speak. And if we we can't even begin to change and change society and the structure until we decide that we want to and decide that we w we want to do better and I and I um that's not saying that black people just need to get it together and we just need to you know get off our butts and all of that but we when we, we really need to think about what they went through when we talk about the history and the pain that yes we did inherit but I, it was it was so much worse so I can't not decide to go to school or you know do whatever it is that I can when I know that they they have James Baldwin, all of them, all their struggles that they faced. Really, I just have to I just have to be here and and learn what they fought so hard for me to, and they didn't even get to they didn't even get to know it. <laughs>